Hi, and welcome to the Geopolitical Futures Podcast. I'm Xander Snyder, and I'm joined today by our Director of Analysis, Jacob Shapiro. How's everything going, Jacob? Everything's going fine, Xander. My head hurts a little bit, but I'm alive and I'm not in Syria, so everything is good. How are you doing? Everything's good here in Los Angeles today, Jacob. Thanks. So today, um, on a relevant note, we're going to be talking about Syria, and more particularly, Turkey's recent intervention, uh, invasion really, of the northwestern region of Afrin in Syria and what that means in terms of the broader strategic situation in the Middle East. So we've now written on this in a couple of articles, but if you look at a map and we'll, we'll, throw, one up, um, we'll throw one up when we post, you, you can see that Aleppo, which sits sort of in the northwest of Syria, um, is, is sort of surrounded on the west by a number of anti-Assad rebels, which are really Turkish proxies like the Free Syrian Army, and then in the north by um, some leftover forces from that are Turkish forces from when Turkey invaded in late 2016 in Operation Euphrates Shield, and then in the very tip northwest of Syria, there's this Kurdish enclave of Afrin. Now, if Syria were to take Afrin, Jacob, what does that entail for the security of Aleppo and, and the Assad regime? Well, I think that this greatly threatens the security of Aleppo, and I think this is something that has been a little bit missed um, by a lot of people in the media. They think that, um, you know, and there is all this other stuff that we need to talk about, but one of the most important things to realize here is that when, when Turkey goes forward to take Afrin, it really puts itself in prime striking distance of Aleppo. And I think the reason Turkey took this step was because they saw that the Assad regime and Russia and Iran were really not um, complying with Turkish requests on the ground. They weren't doing the things that Turkey wanted. Turkey um, is supposed to be managing a de-escalation zone or basically a, a ceasefire zone in this area. And the Assad regime had commenced a major offensive in this area backed by Russian air assets and Iranian advisors on the ground. Um, so you know, they complained and nobody listened to them, and then they had to move forward. And what they did was they basically put um, you know, their soldiers, um, once they conquer Afrin, and I think that's a foregone conclusion, they will put their soldiers very close to Aleppo. They will link up the two biggest strongholds, um, of, or the two biggest anti-Assad strongholds left in the country, and improve the position there um, a great deal. Um, and Xander, you, you've actually done a lot of work on, on what those anti Assad rebels look like. They're, they're a bunch of different types of groups. So how would you characterize sort of the, the lay of the land of those particular rebels? Yeah, it's, it really is sort of a conglomeration of, of a lot of different actors. Sort of the main fighting force has been the Free Syrian Army, which was one of the not-so-moderate anti-Assad rebel groups. Um, and there are elements within it, such as um, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is generally considered to be uh, sort of a, a branch of Al Qaeda, and they're they're involved now, working alongside Turkey. Even though uh, last year they were actually an enemy of Turkey, Turkey was relying on another group called Aral Al Sham, which is in the same region. And uh, Hayat Tahrir Al Sham fought Aral Al Sham and won. Um, so Turkey's main proxy at that point got destroyed in sort of the Idlib region. And when the when Turkey moved into the Idlib province in order to enforce this de-escalation zone that you mentioned, they said they they recognized that they still needed to work with the dominant power there. So since that point, they've been working with Hayat Tahrir al Sham, which is their erstwhile enemy. Um, now, we also saw an announcement later, I think it was late last year, of Turkey creating this national Syrian army, which was going to incorporate the Free Syrian Army as well as another of other disparate rebel groups. Since that that item came out and we caught it on our on our watch list, I've seen ap no references to it. I've seen everyone still referring to Free Syrian Army, so I'm, I'm frankly not sure what the status on that that um, conversion is. But we do have what seems to be a fairly reliable sense of the number of, of the size of the force involved um, in in the West uh, uh, Tur Turkey's uh, fighting proxies. Um, which it, it, it's about fifteen to 20,000, and it might be a little bit more than that. It might be like twenty two or 23,000, but some of those forces are going to remain in the Idlib province to tie down Assad on his offensive in the Idlib province, but the majority of those, um, upwards of 20,000 out of the twenty two or 23,000, seem to be being diverted uh, 
to the north to support the Turkish um, army's invasion of Afrin. Now, the numbers we have for Turkish army troops on the border of Afrin, or now moving into Afrin, is also about the same size, so 15 to 20,000. So we can kind of say that there were probably between 30 and 40,000 um, soldiers um, either in the Turkish military or aligned with the Turkish military moving on the Kurdish enclave, which the best numbers we've seen so far are like eight to 10,000, but those, those numbers I first saw in uh, Anadolu Agency and Daily Sabah, which are both pro-Turkish government newspapers. And since then, like every media outlet has just picked up and repeated those numbers. Um, but I've seen no, no third party corroborating evidence. But that's kind of the best we have right now in the figures. And obviously, the, the balance of power there in terms of like the tactical advantage obviously goes to Turkey, but you gotta remember that invading and an offensive takes a lot more firepower than defending. And I think um, in the first couple of days as the initial battles un um, unfolded between Turkey and, and um, the YPG, um, it, it was maybe not surprising, but an indication of the state of Turkish military capabilities to see the Kurds putting up a pretty good defense. So there's this one hill outside of um, Afrin, I think it was called Barsaya, but forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, where the, Turk, uh, the Turkish forces assaulted it, took it over, um, and then the Kurds launched a counteroffensive, took it back over, and then the Turks took it again. So even though Turkey has all this, this heavy armor and military equipment and air power, the Kurds are still able to push uh, the Turks off this, this strategically located hill. So I think it, it probably, like you said, will unfold in a way that Turkey ends up taking Afrin, but might actually, I mean, the Kurds are going to try to make it as difficult and as bloody a process for Turkey as possible. I think you've pointed out a number of key dynamics that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about what's going on here. Um, the first is, you know, this alphabet soup of different militias and armies and groups that have been organized on the ground um, are hard even for people like us who follow this every day to keep track of, let alone, you know, people who just check in on Syria um, once a week. And honestly, this, this really underscores why the Syrian civil war is going to be a very long, protracted conflict and the reason why it's really just going to kick into a second gear now that the Islamic State is in retreat. There, there are so many different groups um, that it's, it's, it's a little hard to keep track of. But at the end of the day, um, when you just look at the, the demographics of Syria, um, Syria is a majority Sunni Arab country. Um, and that means that of all of the different actors, outside actors here that are playing around in Syria, and I'm thinking of Iran and Russia and the United States, none of them have um, the religious similarity um, that Turkey does to them. And none of these countries also have actually ruled Syria before. I mean, this, this part of Syria used to be a province of the Ottoman Empire, and there are good strategic reasons um, for modern-day Turkey and then the Ottoman Empire before it to want to control this region. So... And then the last part of that is also that Aleppo is a predominantly Arab city. Um, other cities in Syria are a lot more diverse, but and Aleppo does have some diversity. I'm not saying it's 100% Arab, but the, the majority of the population there is Sunni and is Arab. And that's why it has been one of the hot spots in the Syrian civil war. I think that's why it will continue to be one of the hot spots of the Syrian war. And then the second thing you underlined was the fate of the Syrian Kurds. Um, and the Syrian Kurds have to fight because, you know, if they don't, you know, they, if they don't fight, they're going to get, it's not going to be good for them anyway. They're really fighting for their survival. Um, but Afrin has always been a difficult proposition. Um, this is a Kurdish enclave, but it is separated uh, from the rest of the major Kurdish enclaves in Syria. Um, you know, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is sort of the U.S. proxy group on the ground, um, it's really sort of the front group for the YPG, which is the militia for the Syrian Kurds, and I again apologize for the alphabet soup of militias, um, they are predominantly in eastern Syria, and they have, you know, fought very well against the Islamic State in eastern Syria and, you know, have been managing their own territory there in, in the part of Syria that is really the breadbasket of Syria in terms of agricultural production. They've been managing that for a couple of years now. Um, Afrin has always been cut off from that. They've never had the military support of the fighters um, in Afrin that they did in the, rest of the Syrian, in the rest of the Syrian Kurdish areas. And because of the way the geography is, the Syrian Kurdish areas couldn't reinforce Afrin. Um, you saw, you know, that when the Syrian Kurds initially crossed the Euphrates, 
hopefully we can put this on the map. Um, you know, that was when Turkey really sort of woke up, and that was what led to their first military intervention because they didn't want the Syrian Kurds to push past the Euphrates and eventually link up the Kurdish enclaves. Um, but if we're thinking about how this conflict is going to continue, um, once Turkey uh, handles Efrin, um, we're going to have to think in terms of, well, what is Turkey going to do with this other much stronger Kurdish enclave that is backed by the United States? Um, you actually were the one that pointed out to me originally that the United States basically gave Turkey a green light in Afrin. They basically said, look, this is not under the jurisdiction of the coalition against the Islamic State. The United States is not going to defend here. I don't think that's true of eastern Syria. Um, even so, though, the Syrian Kurds are in a very, very difficult position. It's not a very good geography to defend at all. And, and in terms of firepower, they don't have a lot going for them. I think that's right. And it's something really that... Um it's worth keeping in mind when, when looking at the, the Turkish intervention in Afrin is that the U.S. has not included it in his area of operation. So when um, the spokesperson for the U.S. force in Syria uh, a couple weeks ago came out and announced that the U.S. is going to create this new 30,000-strong uh, mil ar army militia in northern Syria comprised of Kurdish and other militias, uh, Turkey freaked out, and then the next day, the same spokesperson came back on and said specifically, you know, a friend's not in our area of operations. And that's th that was the impetus for Turkey launching the attack. I think they did it several days later over the weekend. Um, and the narrative that's been picked up is, oh, well, Turkey is now fighting U.S. allies. And what does that imply? You know, is the U.S. going to have to respond? And I think that really kind of misses the point. And again, it comes down to the, compl the complexity of the situation as you outlined it, Jacob, which is, yes, the YPG and the SDF, sorry, all the Kurdish military forces in Syria, um, some of the Kurdish military forces in Syria are U.S. allies, but the U.S. is not, it's not in the U.S.'s interest to defend Afrin um, because it just doesn't offer it it doesn't confer a large strategic advantage to the U.S. And we've written about this in detail, and we won't get into all the detail here, but it's the situation is that the U.S. does support the YPG, but it doesn't need a friend to be defended. So even though everyone thinks that like this clash between the U.S. and Turkey is, is imminent, the U.S. basically allowed Turkey to move into a friend. And, and I think you can make the argument that the U.S. taking, or sorry, Turkey taking a friend actually works in U.S. interest because, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, it surrounds Aleppo and it puts a lot of pressure on Assad and therefore Iranians, uh, Iran's position in Syria, and I think to a lesser degree Russia's position in Syria, but certainly that as well. So, what what that means is Iran is now looking at a a tactical situation where Aleppo is this really bloody battle that was fought earlier in the Syrian civil war, a lot of lives were expended to, to, to take it back, and Iran is seeing Turkish power grow and projected through Syria. So Iran will be forced to either provide enough weapons to, or enough assistance to Assad to be able to defend Aleppo, or run the risk of perhaps Turkey pushing further east at some point in the future. I don't think that would happen imminently, because the battle for a friend, I think, is going to end up being more costly for Turkey than they imagined, even though I still think they will take a friend. Well, I just, I, I just want to complicate a couple of things you said, Xander, and say, first of all, I think you're correct that there's no, um, there's no like immediate military conflict or even break in the alliance between Turkey and the United States coming. If you want a, a, a litmus test for how the how Turkish-U.S. relations are doing, as long as U.S. forces are at Incirlik base, the U.S.-Turkish relationship, even though there's a lot of sort of public bravado and back and forth, is, is ultimately fine. Um, I don't think that the U.S. and Turkey are going to come into any real conflict over a friend, um, but I think there are two things to think about here. The first is that um, you know, the U.S. has been wanting Turkey to come into this conflict for a long time. Um, now that Turkey has come into it, I think the U.S., might begin to second guess itself a little bit because Turkey has shown that it is far more willing to work uh, with groups that the U.S. would categorize as radical Islamic groups. Um, uh, Turkey is more willing to work with those groups than the United States is. And Turkey has different definitions for what they think of as too far beyond the pale. Um, and if Turkey is going to enable some of those groups, that's not a situation that the United States necessarily wants to see. On the second issue, and this has to do with you know where the Syrian Kurds are stronger in the east of the country, 
Um, you're correct that the United States really doesn't have any hard, cold geopolitical interests um, in terms of it's not important for the United States to control territory or have proxies in the eastern Syrian desert. Um, what I would say, though, is that the U.S. has built the SDF and the Syrian Kurds into a U.S. ally, both on the ground and in the media. And the U.S. has made a point of talking about these Syrian Kurds as their best ally in the fight against the Islamic State, which has continually rankled uh, people in Turkey because they think of themselves as um, the most helpful and, and, and uh, effective enemy of the Islamic State. Um, and if the United States is going to let Turkey in eventually and is not going to defend its own ally, that has major implications for U.S. security promises throughout the region. Now, I will also say um, that a U.S. security promise in the Middle East uh, post-Second Iraq War was not very good in the first place anyway. And at a certain point, um, you know, we have to think about, you know, Second Iraq War, the rise of the Islamic State, uh, the Obama administration, Syria, chemical weapons, red line, um, you know, supporting uh, the protests in Egypt before really understanding what was going on there. Um, the U.S. has continually sort of stuck its foot in its mouth when it has been in the Middle East, and it might be that people in the Middle East just don't take the U.S. very seriously. But I would say the U.S. is setting the stage for some kind of either embarrassment or conflict down the road in the way that it has built up the Syrian Kurds as a U.S. ally. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, when I, when I said that the U.S. doesn't have geopolitical interest, I was speaking more of the Afrin region. I, I do agree with you that it has a greater interest in the northern and northeastern Syrian Kurds. Um, and that's why the, the U.S. is sponsoring this, uh, f what is it called, border frontier force or something like that. That's supposed to be 30,000 people strong, even though they're only training 230 people right now. So we'll see if it actually materializes, right? Um, and if, if, you, if you look at a map... Um, what, what, the question you have to ask yourself is why the U.S. is doing that. Because purportedly, during the entire war, it has been focused on destroying ISIS. And ISIS is not completely gone, but most of its territory has been lost, and it's been reduced more or less to an insurgency. We've seen some signs that they might be making a very small comeback in certain areas, um, but it, it seems like ISIS is basically dead. So why is the U.S. you know, committing... In, this this long term to, to this long term strategy in Syria it must be for something else, and we 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 write about this a lot in in a number of different um, pieces we've published. How at the end of the day, the U.S. is interested in balancing power in different regions to prevent one regional power from from taking over and becoming a regional hegemon. So, what that force in the north does is one, it does cement some U.S. influence if you know. Iran was ever to try to project power uh, through the Assad government further west, but also if Turkey were to get powerful enough to push further east, um, it, it would force them to consider holding back a certain number of reserves to protect their northern flank on that advance. Now, I don't think the U.S. would actually encourage the Kurds to attack Turkey at any point, but it is something that strategically Turkey would need to consider, and that would diminish the amount of power that it could project further East. So even though Turkey is an American ally and currently still remains an American ally, that contributes to this balance of power strategy. I, I think that's also right. And I also think you can't undersell um, that the U.S., you know, the Islamic State has been defeated mostly as a territorial entity. But the fight against the Islamic State for the U.S. is not just a fight against the territorial entity. Um, it's a fight against radical Islam in general, because the United States since 2001 has made it a point to try and strike against these types of Islamic um, jihadi groups wherever they are. And, you know, the Islamic State is still there. And when I say it's still there, I mean that there are still people who believe in that ideology, who are on the ground, who are biding their time, waiting for another power vacuum to reemerge. Uh, when I say they're still there <clears throat> in some of the anti-Assad strongholds like you talked about, we have the Syrian version of al-Qaeda. Um, Iraq, uh, which we haven't talked about very much, um, is also not particularly stable. There was a, a very large suicide bombing in Baghdad just a couple weeks ago that ISIS claimed responsibility for. And you know the blueprint for ISIS was really about um, taking advantage of different sectarian rivalries to emerge. So um, you know I, I wouldn't I wouldn't underestimate just how much the United States in its current strategic framework,
um, thinks in terms of having to continue to fight against the Islamic State or whatever Islamic um, radical group is the most powerful at the time. I would say, though, that the United States has sort of boxed itself in um, since 9-11 in the sense that, um, you know, the war when it began was the war on terror. And now it's the war on sort of, you know, jihadism, if you will. And these are very difficult things to defeat. Um, it's very difficult to defeat an ideology. And in a lot of ways, all the U.S. can do is sort of play a game of whack-a-mole. It can hit them where they are and make sure that they don't have bases and, and, and all those other things. But it becomes a tactical um, nightmare to continue hitting these jihadi groups where they pop up. And then it also puts the United States in a very difficult strategic position. Um, so I think you can kind of see in you know the U.S.'s current posture towards the Middle East all that dynamic playing out. And I would also point out um, that you also begin to see um, how different U.S. administrations, no matter what their political ideology, uh, face the very same problems and have a very difficult time uh, dealing with them. Obama, The Obama administration had one way of trying to do it. The Trump administration has one way of trying to do it. Um, either way, those groups are still there. Jacob, one question I want to be sure to ask you before we close out today. How does Russia play into the Afrin of invasion. Where do they sit? What do they want? What are they getting out of it? How are they interacting with Turkey? Well, we just talked about the U.S. boxing itself in a corner. I think Russia has also boxed itself into a little bit of a corner here, too. Um, you know, Russia, all things being equal, doesn't want to see anything happen that increases Turkish strength. Um, and while I don't think that Turkey being forced into this move is a particularly good show of strength for Turkey, um, I will say that the long-term strategic position that it puts Turkey in is not a position that uh, Russia particularly likes. Russia wants to preserve the Assad regime and wants to preserve Syria as an enemy of Turkey and as a buffer zone and as a Russian ally in the region. Um, and if you're going to put Turkish forces within 30 miles of you know, the most popular, or it's not the most popular, the most populous and the city in Syria, when I'm, and I mean Aleppo there, um, that's not good. Um, on the flip side of this, though, um, we have to remember that Russia came into Syria uh, really looking to to distract its population from some of the economic problems it was having and some of its failures in Ukraine, and also to get its military some on-the-ground training. Um, it's accomplished all that. The Russian military invention, uh, intervention um, achieved its goals, even with a very limited deployment, uh, and it's been very popular um, in terms of its ability to, to keep a Russian ally um, at the helm of an important country. At the same time, though, um, you know, Russia does not want an unending engagement in the Middle East any more than the United States does. So, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin announced in December that, you know, he had declared victory uh, in Syria and that it was time to reach a diplomatic solution. And he, the Russia has been orchestrating this relationship between Iran and Turkey and Russia to try and bring that to pass. And there's actually a big conference coming up in Sochi between the different anti-Assad rebel groups. Uh, and I think that what happened here was, and this is inference, and I, I don't have any proof of this, but I, I would say that probably what happened here is that Russia agreed to pull its military observers out of Afrin um, in return for Turkey guaranteeing that it would get the anti-Assad rebels at the negotiation table in Sochi. I think that what Russia has done here is that it has prioritized its need to be able to show some kind of diplomatic victory uh, in Syria and have something to show for its military intervention over actually holding a friend and trusting that if anybody actually did make any kind of move towards Aleppo, that the Syrian army in conjunction with Russia and Iran would be able to fend them off. Um, I think in some ways you have to think in terms of, you know, for Russia, it, it, they, they made a little bit of a gamble. They supported the Assad, the Assad regime's offensive into this Idlib de-escalation zone. Um, if Turkey uh, didn't do anything, then the Assad regime would look very good and some of the anti-Assad rebels were beaten back. And if Turkey did do something, then at least Turkey was drawn into the Syrian morass, uh, and at least they might be able to get um, Turkey to agree to some kind of deal um, in getting those um, anti-Assad rebels into Sochi. So that's that's more speculation. What I can tell you for sure is that Russia does not want to be in Syria forever any more than the United States wants to be in Syria forever. And Russia here, I think, has prioritized its need for an overall settlement um, against maybe some of the more tactical issues, or it needs this hill or that hill to be defended. And also, it should be noted, I mean, it, you know, they had military observers in Afrin, and they were there to try and prevent exactly what's happening right now. So this was a bit of a retreat from a Russian perspective. Yeah, I think that's right. And just 
goes to show you that alliances do not dictate interests. It's the other way around, right? So Russia is going to be doing what's best for it within Syria, and that that will mean supporting Assad to a degree. But a lot of people are saying, like, oh, well, Russia is Assad's ally, so um, does that mean they're going to come, you know, start fighting Turkey? And Russia doesn't want to fight Turkey right now. So while it's not happy that Turkey's moving into Af Afrin, it's not sufficiently worthwhile to Russia to go, go gen start a war with Turkey in order to defend, defend that area. No, and I mean, like I said, I think from Russia's perspective, if Turkey is going to be, um, you know, involving itself in different areas of Russian influence, it, Russia would prefer that it be Syria as opposed to the Balkans or the Caucasus or any of the other places that Turkey can compete with, with Russia. And um, just one more thing I would like to bring up before we, before we end the podcast, Sander, is just, you know, people... You know, we work for George Friedman, and one of George's, um, I would say, most, um, well, not, not most noticeable, but one of his most distinctive forecasts, I think, has been that Turkey is the rising power in the Middle East. And I, a lot of times when we write stuff about Turkey, uh, people get upset on social media, or they write in and they tell us we're completely biased, and how could we know what we're talking about, and why are we so pro-Turkish, or pro-this, or pro-that, and the other thing. And I just want to point out that, you know, this forecast... Um, is a major long-term forecast at GPF. It's not built on any kind of ideology or political desire. It's just that when you look at the geopolitics of the region, it seems to us um, that this is going to be an area where Turkish power is going to be strongly felt. And um, you know, you can't necessarily predict the exact things that are going to, to draw Turkey into this region, but I think we're beginning to see it a little bit. You're beginning to see that um, Turkish power is not being exercised here because Turkey feels like it needs to come in and conquer Syria to defend its security, right? Um, Turkey has almost had its hand forced. It has to, it's doing these little piecemeal interventions in Syria in these different places because, you know, a threat comes up here and it has exhausted all of its options and then it has to intervene. Same thing happened in Efrin. A threat popped up there with the rebel groups that it was supporting in Syria. It exhausted all the different means that it could to try and solve the situation. That didn't work. Eventually they had to go to their last resort and use their own military. Um, this is one of the ways that I... Like, that geo, geopolitics compels nations, I think, to act rather than this idea that nations can sort of sit down and set goals. Um, so when, when we think about Turkey and when we're thinking in the long term here for us at Geopolitical Futures, we're looking at this in, the ter in terms of not just of what's happening right now, although that's very important, we've talked about it a lot today, but also in the long term, what this means 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And that's why when you think about the idea of Turkish troops, you know, within 30 miles of Aleppo and what that means 10 years from now, um, that might be a major deal. And when you think about what Turkish power is going to look like 10 years from now and Russian power 10 years from now and Iranian power 10 years from now and all the stuff that's going on on the ground right now, you can kind of begin to see um, not just um, Turkey's underlying strength and its underlying advantage in this particular region, uh, but also the things that are, that are going to drag Turkey into this region, even though Turkey might actually want to spend its resources elsewhere. Well, with that, we uh, we hope this podcast has been clarifying and and not it didn't make it more confusing to follow everything. It really is a very very complex battlefield right now. Um, but follow some of our writing, and you'll get even more of the nitty gritty details and some more of the long term context that Jacob just talked about. So, Jacob, thanks for chatting, and thanks for listening to Geopolitical Futures podcast. Always a pleasure. See you out there. For more geopolitical insights from the team at Geopolitical Futures, sign up for our free weekly email newsletter using the link in the description.